Good morning. Uh, I guess uh, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Senthil Jayarajan. We affectionately just call Jay. So I've known Jane for, Jay for quite a long time. Uh, he started a surgical training out of Temple University where he did his uh, general surgery residency. Uh, then he went to a little known program for fellowship at Wash U Barnes was able to suffer through that, and then actually took a job there, uh, was my assist, associate program director for a little bit of time. Uh, then he realized that there were better places out there and was recruited to MHI, and he's been here for about a little over, almost two years now, I think two years, a little over two years. Uh, at his role here, one of the jobs that we've asked him to do is uh, become an expert in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and he's sort of taken our program here and uh, is one of the busiest programs in the area, uh, and we're going to ask for him to share some of his knowledge and uh, tell us a little bit about how our uh, center runs here. So uh, without further delay, I will have uh, Dr. Jaya Rajan come up. Good morning. Uh, there's working. Okay. My name is Sendal Jirajan. Today I'm going to talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This is a treatment modality that a lot of uh, clinicians don't really get that much exp experience in or exposure to. It has a lot of benefit for a very select uh, group of disease processes. But the extent of these benefits are often misconstrued uh, by the public and as well as the media. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you type in hyperbaric oxygen therapy into Google, the, one of the top five links is always invariably Justin Bieber sleeps in a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber um, for his uh, chronic depression. Uh, while uh, this is unfortunately not a proven fact uh, effect of hyperbarics. There is maybe some data that could prove it, but uh, it's still in early phases. Also, a lot of people that I talk to, a lot of the patients that I meet with, um, they think that they're going in, in to be enclosed in like underwater, in an underwater uh, inside this huge chamber, which isn't happening. And uh, they, you know, that really kind of turns them off to hyperbarics. Uh, the reason why they probably think there's water involved is because we call each of our sessions a dive. Uh, this is kind of harkening back to the first uh, uh, utilization of hyperbaric oxygen, uh, which was for uh, treatment of deep compression sickness. So, so today I'm going to give a brief overview of the history of hyperbaric medicine. Then we're going to talk about the mechanism of action as well as kind of what the average patient experiences uh, when they come for a session. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, some of the indications of, that we treat here at uh, Abbott Northwestern and uh, the, uh, where, I, where I think the field is going hopefully in the next five or ten years. So what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? It is essentially the exposure of patients to high pressures uh, while breathing 100% oxygen. To be considered hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it has to be the entire patient inside the chamber. There are machines out there that you can buy that will do regional or limb hyperbarics, but there isn't that much data for that this actually is working the way they uh, are marketing it to be. So the whole patient is placed inside a special airtight chamber that can be pressurized and uh, oxygen can be delivered. The duration of therapy as well as the pressure will usually varies a little bit with the indications. So a little bit of history. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not a new concept. The Persians and Greeks in ancient times discussed the effects of high pressures uh, that were encountered by divers that had been employed to dig up uh, shipwrecks and things like that. The first documented use of Hyperbaric therapy was in 1662 by uh, Nathaniel Henshaw. He used hyperbaric air for the treatment of consumption, asthma, chronic bronchitis, as well as improvement of digestion and other uses. He created a chamber called the domicilium 
which increased the ambient pressure um, pressure uh, with uh, valves and bellows. This is all remarkable because this was all prior to the discovery of oxygen. So you know they didn't have any idea of any of that. Oh, I, I slide moved on. So um, then after after this, uh, hyperbaric chambers became more popular in, in Europe in the 1800s. Uh, a French engineer by the name of Paul Burt, uh, he was also a physician and scientist, uh, began to really kind of lay down the laws of hyperbarics uh, and described decompression sickness as well as nitrogen bubbles. In 1879, J.A. Fontaine built a mobile operating room uh, that was pressurized. He started conducting some of the earliest serious clinical studies in hyperbaric medicine. In 1928, uh, Dr. Orville Cunningham, an anesthesiologist, built the largest chamber in the world in Cleveland, Ohio. It was called a steel ball hospital. It was six stories tall, and here they treated all sorts of conditions, including arthritis, diabetes, syphilis, However, he was unable to actually demonstrate any benefit, and uh, the hospital was broken down for scrap during World War II. In 1937, the first success of hyperbaric oxygen therapy was documented. Uh, it was used to treat decompression sickness uh, suffered by deep sea divers. Advances in hyperbaric oxygen therapy began to speed up uh, with a deeper understanding of the physics of gases, as well as blood gas analysis and gas exchange physiology. In the 1960s, wounds began to be treated by hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The first treatment of gas gangrene was reported at the in University of uh, Amsterdam. The first subacute and chronic wounds were healed using HBOT. Uh, were these burns that were sustained uh, from coal mine explosions, which were somewhat uh, common back then. Since the 1970s, uh, HBOT, or hyperbaric oxygen therapy, began to find its place in the treatment of specific indications and also some legitimacy uh, with creation of medical societies to monitor progress and usage. How does HBOT work? A lot of basic science research has been done to understand the role that oxygen plays in wound healing and how hyperbaric oxygen therapy augments these functions. Fortunately or unfortunately, the physics of gases does play a large role in all of this understanding. I'm going to spare you most of the gas laws, but there is one that is, uh, that is still important to our understanding of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Henry's law states that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas above the liquid. Essentially, more pressure a gas exerts above a liquid, the more gas that is dissolved in the fluid. For our purposes, this means that th we're talking about the oxygen that's getting dissolved in the blood plasma. So with hyper, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we're, we're hoping to hyperoxygenate the blood plasma, cerebrospinal fluid, and lymph fluid. And it has been documented at clinical hyperbaric pressures that we get about 10 to 15 times the normal amount of oxygen that, that is dissolved into the plasma. And as we'll see later, this allows the bypass of body's normal system of trans transporting oxygen. So here we have in the top left corner kind of everything that we are normally experiencing right now. A pressure that is around the uh, pressure that we see at sea level, uh, and we're breathing 21% FiO2. In this state, the amount of oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin is about 19 cc's, and the amount that's in the plasma is 0.32. Now, when we are breathing 100% oxygen at the same pressure, you see that we've maximized the amount of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin. And we also see a dramatic increase in the amount of oxygen that's, that's, bound, uh, that's dissolved in the plasma. 
So we know from Henry's law that increasing pressure increases the solubility of a gas. So with HBOT, more pressure pushes more oxygen into the plasma. So at two or three times the pressure, now we're having a proportional increase in the oxygen content of plasma. The key point here, a little simplified, is that the additional plasma oxygen, with this plasma, additional plasma oxygen, the tissue's needs are being met without oxygen that's being delivered through the hemoglobin, with, from the hemoglobin, oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin. We believe that this is what is responsible for most of the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. As we all know, poor blood flow to tissues will lead to poor oxygenation and then also to tissue damage. In this cartoon, a restriction either due to disease, clot, and injury leads to blockage of the red blood cells passing through and thus reducing delivery of oxygen to tissues. Plasma, however, is still flowing through uh, the damaged blood vessel. At normal conditions, this, the oxygen content of the plasma is minimal and is not able to support tissues. <clears throat> Under hyperbaric conditions, which increases the oxygen content of the plasma, the plasma then reaches, that plasma that reaches beyond the occlusion is able to deliver oxygen and support tissue and reduce the damage that's occurred by having not enough blood flow to that area. It also increases the oxygenation of the lymph fluid, which further mitigates tissue damage. So oxygen is more than just a metabolite. It, it initiates signal transduction, and it also activates wound healing pathways. It does this through multiple different ways. Uh, it it uh, aids in stem cell mobilization and angiogenesis, and all of this contributes to limiting ischemia damage, cell death, inflammation. It promotes fibroblast uh, stimulation and collagen synthesis. It decreases lactate production and tissue acidosis. It also helps with oxygen-independent killing of bacteria. So now we kind of understand how HBOT could help. How does this work for the average patient? The patient is, is brought and placed inside a chamber after ensuring there is no flammable or static-producing materials on them, like polyester, makeup, anything that could potentially uh, uh, be uh, uh, be flammable. So the reason why is fire in the chamber is the most deadly risk of hy uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Even a small spark could cause a conflagration. The good thing is that there has only been one fire event in America in the last decade or so uh, where it seems that they were not following all the safety protocols they should have been. So now, once the patient's in the chamber, the pressure is slowly increased. Uh, you know, we're going from surface to a depth, as uh, is terminology. And this, in, this occurs over five to 10 minutes. And once they're at depth, they spend about 90 minutes here uh, with air breaks. The air breaks are, are utilized to reduce oxygen toxicity, and, uh, and, and which manifests as seizures. Once their treatment is completed, the patient is then brought up from depth to the surface slowly again over about five to 15 minutes. So I think the key thing here is that this is not a quick one and done treatment. It's a long commitment. It is usually two hours a day, five days a week for at least two to eight weeks, depending on the indication. Usually an average about six weeks. And all of this, all the times that we have, the, the, and the duration of the treatment may even be extended if the wound's not completely healed yet. But if you're thinking, if you think about it, we're trying to compress healing that is usually done over months to years to weeks and months. Uh, so it, you know, it does take time for the body to still heal, even with uh, augmentation. 
We generally do not expect to see an improvement in healing of wounds for at least two weeks, but usually uh, we see some improvement by four weeks. Uh, sometimes uh, you can see some symptomatic relief, uh, like reduction in pain or bleeding, uh, sooner within the two-week uh, period. There are two different types of chambers that uh, are utilized for a, a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. One is a multi-place chamber. Uh, it's a large room that is pressurized and uh, oxygen is delivered via mask. This is, uh, allows multiple people to be treated at the same time, about six to eight with an attendant uh, in the room with them. I think uh, the greatest benefit is that it, it allows for uh, treatment of critically ill patients as well who are vented, who are uh, needing uh, pressors or something like that. Uh, this is a monoplace chamber. This is uh, what we actually have. We have three of these chambers here at Abbott. Um, and it's essentially one patient per chamber. It does allow for more individualized treatments, uh, protocols, like you can vary the amount of pressure. And it's also more commonly available, at least in America. What are some of the adverse effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Uh, ear pain from barotrauma is the most common side effect. Uh, it happens anywhere from 2 to 10%. Uh, there are different maneuvers that we can do, like slow down the ascent or, uh, or descent, uh, that can mitigate some of the pain. But at times, we have to uh, have tubes placed by ENT. The other common <coughs> or more common uh, side effect, which is still about 2%, is uh, myopia. This can, we, while we don't really understand exactly why this is happening, uh, we do believe that it's happening because of hardening of the uh, lens and changing refractive power. This, but this usually occurs after an extended period, a period of time in hyperbarics, about 40 or 50 dives, and even closer to 100 dives. Seizures are a manifestation of CNS oxygen toxicity. It's fairly uncommon. Uh, there are no long-term sequelae. Essentially, the solution is to turn off the oxygen, keep them at depth until the seizure is completed, and then bring them up as soon as we can. The reason for this is that during a seizure, they're not having complete control of the respiration. You need to be breathing out, or else you'll cause uh, uh, a pneumothorax. So pneumothorax, very rare, uh, about one in uh, a, mi a million dives. Essentially, we bring them up as soon as possible. Uh, we keep the oxygen going. I think the main caveat here is that an emergency cessation of hyperbaric oxygen therapy still takes about 10 minutes to come up from, uh, from depth. So it's kind of an extended period of time just standing there watching this person coming up. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy can also exacerbate congestive heart failure. So generally, anyone who has an EF of less than 40%, 40% generally uh, we opt to run at a lower pressure. Absolute contraindications include untreated tension pneumothorax, as well as more uh, current use and recent within two weeks of uh, certain medications like doxorubicin uh, because it's cardiotoxicity, cisplatin and sulfamylon because they impair wound healing, uh, bleomycin for, because it uh, has interstitial pneumonitis. Relative contraindications include decompensated heart failure, severe respiratory infections because they can't clear their, their passages and therefore can increase uh, chance for uh, barotrauma in the ears. Uh, high fevers, they have to be lowered before uh, we start a session. Emphysema with CO2 retention, uh, largely because, as we know, increase the pressure from Boyle's Law, increase the pressure, increase the volume, then that would increase the chance for pulmonary barotrauma and pneumothorax because now we have a big pocket of air that shouldn't be there. Uh, history of thoracic surgery, this is a little bit more of a soft contraindication, depends on what surgery they had done. Uh, 
cancer, some highly vascular cancers is more of a theoretical risk. It has been completely proven. Uh, it's the idea that now we're providing oxygen and we're aiding angiogenesis and therefore we are uh, put, uh, potentially uh, increasing the chances of increasing the size of the cancer or even metastasis. And then uh, the, the more common uh, issues that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, high blood pressure. Uh, as well as low blood sugars, largely because hyperbaric oxygen therapy increases the blood pressure of the patient and uh, decreases the blood sugars. Usually, the blood sugars are dropped by anywhere from 30 to 50, so it is a, um, a consideration that uh, needs to be taken seriously. So we've kind of talked about how hyperbaric oxygen therapy works and kind of what a patient goes through during treatment. What are the indications that hyperbaric oxygen works for? There are about 14 different indications. Uh, uh, acute carbon monoxide intoxication uh, is uh, one that's used not infrequently. It's actually even, they have portable monoplace chambers that can be deployed at coal mines uh, in West Virginia if they have uh, an accident. Um, it's also used for decompression sickness, gas embolism, crush injury, uh, and other traumatic injuries, as well as cyanide poisoning. The indications on the right over there is what we normally are treating here at Abbott. <coughs> uh, this includes soft tissue radiation injury, diabetic lower extremity wounds, arterial insufficiencies, uh, compromised skin flaps or muscle flaps, osteoarthritis necrosis, uh, chronic osteomyelitis for at least six months, and then progressive necrotizing infections and gas gangrene. These are indications that are indicated, that are approved by the uh, medical board for uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, medical society, sorry, and uh, as well as CMS. That said, there are a lot of off-label uses. Uh, it, anywhere from aging and sports injury, as well as recovery, to macular degeneration, arthritis. Uh, it's been used for Crohn's disease because it uh, does reduce inflammation. So these are all uses that are used also in America, but kind of worldwide. So let's talk about some patients that we've treated in the last year. This is, was a 82-year-old gentleman who developed a left toe diabetic foot ulcer and developed osteomyelitis about four to six months before he presented here. He had undergone multiple arterial revascularizations without, with little success. Uh, he had had a TMA performed uh, one month prior to presenting for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, and he had also already been told that you know, his TMA was failing and he would likely need a below knee am amputation, which he was fairly adamantly against. He received a vascular surgery consult. Uh, the ABI demonstrated uh, non-compressible uh, PT and DPs, no flow uh, seen. And uh, he was taken for an angiogram, uh, which did try to try and improve the arterial circulation. However, there were really no good revascularization options for both endovascular and open uh, uh, techniques. However, one thing that was going for him was that his TCPO2 showed that while there was a re significant reduction in readings at baseline, uh, if it's less than 40 millimeters of mercury, you, you think that it's not going to heal well. Uh, but the important thing here was that with an oxygen challenge, he, this was increased to 83 millimeters of mercury. Essentially, if you are, and the way the oxygen challenge works is that we redo the, the test with uh, the person breathing 100% oxygen. And if it's greater than 35 and increases by at least 50% from baseline, studies have shown that uh, there's about a 69% chance of complete healing. So this is the angiogram. As you can see, the flow becomes less and less robust as you go uh, further distal. So he was treated uh, uh, with 2.4 ATA for about 90 minutes with air breaks. Uh, this is what his 
uh, wound looked like uh, just the day that he started or the day prior to when he started. This is an image of how it looked like during uh, his, uh, his time in the, in the treatment, uh, starting to dry up. The necrotic tissue seems to be improving. There's probably like a debridement between here and here. Uh, and then finally, at the end, uh, about 37 days later, it's mostly healed, and uh, I think that scab just fell off later. So this is a gentleman who had poor wound healing potential of a TMA flap, given his diabetes, as well as poor arterial revascularization options. But what was going for him was that he had a favorable TCPO2 with a good response to oxygen challenge. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy here was a good adjunct for, was an adjunct to good wound care principles and uh, here, done here at the wound clinic, we were able to encourage a good, we, <coughs> a good wound healing response and avoid major amputation in this gentleman. Another gentleman, a uh, 69-year-old who had sustained a traumatic right leg fracture during a boating accident uh, and already had a repair of the uh, bone with a uh, bone fracture with uh, an ORIF uh, before he had been seen. Um, he had been having a right ankle ulceration for about six months that was resistant to healing. He underwent a bone biopsy and bone scan and was found to have osteomyelitis and was placed on antibiotics. He had been wheelchair bound due to the pain uh, with weight bearing at the wound uh, for nearly a year and on disability at the time of presentation. So he was started again on 2.4 ATA for 90 minutes uh, with air brakes. As you can see here on the first day he had, uh, his wound was very tender, it was purulent and had a fair amount of induration around it. Over the course of his treatment, we see that it's, uh, the wound starts to, to clear up, to dry, and, uh, and become mostly healed by the time he was done with his treatment. So this was a non-healing crush injury with an open ulceration and chronic myelitis. HBOT as an adjunct to good wound care principles, as well as appropriate treatment of osteomyelitis, was able to encourage a wound healing response, and we were able to avoid a above knee amputation in this gentleman. He began uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy confined to a wheelchair, but over the course of his treatment, with the pain being reduced, uh, he was able to participate in physical therapy, and by the end, he was back to walking with a cane or a walker for assistance. This is another case uh, where it's a 53-year-old gentleman who was transferred here on an urgent basis. Uh, he's a, uh, he was undergoing chemotherapy for acute promyelocytic leukemia. He developed MRSA bacteremia and left, and, uh, left hip and thigh necrotizing soft tissue infection. He had underwent multiple debridements already at the outside facility and, uh, and then really got transferred here for uh, consideration for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The, his alternative would actually have been a left hip disarticulation in talking with the orthopedic surgeon. And the orthopedic surgeon was actually afraid that it would, it would fail because of how bad the infection really was. His initial CT scan uh, demonstrated a large, complex, lobulated abscess, essentially, in his left hip and uh, thigh. Uh, it had uh, also shown that there was a fair, a fair amount of myonecrosis. And, uh, that there were small, uh, multiple small pelvic wall abscesses along the uh, pelvic brim on the left side. This is an image of the CAT scan. You can kind of see the abscess kind of here, and probably necrosis is in this, in this area right here. So. He began uh, hyperbaric therapy uh, pretty much on the day of transfer. Uh, he had continued for about 15 sessions, five days a week, three, sorry, five days a week, three weeks. He did have uh, debridements continue to be performed by orthopedic surgery uh, through multiple incisions. Uh, they were not able to actually drain the pelvic abscesses because they were kind of small 
and they couldn't be reached uh, from an open procedure, uh, open approach. After the necrosis was controlled, uh, the uh, wounds uh, were, were closed or covered with primatrix. Uh, about two months after discharge, he was ambulating again uh, with minor assistance. Uh, he had resumed his oncologic treatments, and his thigh wounds had completely healed, and he was off antibiotics. So successful treatment of necro necrotizing soft tissue infection and uh, return to a pretty decent uh, functional status after hyperbaric oxygen therapy, along with the serial debridements, back dressings, antibiotics, uh, potentially reduced uh, the loss of muscle, as well as uh, helped him to keep his leg. So uh, this is uh, a paper that, was, uh, that we published in 2015 uh, for uh, basically our experience with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We actually opened our doors here at two, in 2006, and uh, the results of this paper actually still correlate pretty well for uh, more recent uh, published uh, series. Uh, here we have about uh, 234 patients that were treated over this period of time between 2010 to 2013. Uh, about 183 were actually included. As you can see here, soft tissue radionecrosis was, a, was our most common uh, indication, and I think it still remains so. Uh, the next most common is uh, failed flaps. So, for diabetic foot ulcer, uh, a success was thought to be anything that was greater than 50% healed, uh, and improvement was uh, a little bit less than 50% healed, and then failed was actually just amputation. As you can see here, the improved and success rate was about 74%. For failing flap, the success uh, was deemed to be a, it was deemed to be a success if it was about 75 to 100 percent take uh, improvement if it's 50 to 75 uh, take, and then failed uh, if the graft was uh, less than 50 percent ta uh, taken or a new graft was needed. And as you can see here, it's about 75 percent uh, for success rate. The literature itself says it's anywhere between 70 to 80 percent. So, osteoradionecrosis. Generally, what we treat here when it comes to osteoradionecrosis is mandibular osteoradionecrosis. Uh, uh, this usually occurs after radiation therapy of head, head and neck cancers. Prior to utilizing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, treatment of this issue was, uh, had really dismal uh, success rates, anywhere from 40 to 50%. Uh, in published series, so it could be even lower than that. But after institution of the MARCS protocol, which is you do anywhere from 20 to 30 dyes before surgery and then 10 dyes after surgery, this goes up to about 95 to 99 percent. Our, percent, our, our success rate was about that as well. Um, soft tissue radionecrosis, also a, a uh, entity that's uh, that does well with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We're at about 88%, um, which is a little higher than actually usually reported. It's anywhere between 75 to 85%. Uh, the key thing here is that more sessions are often needed uh, than other indications. So we generally just start them with a plan of 40 sessions, where the average is usually about 30 for, like, let's say, a leg wound or something. And this includes radiation cystitis, laryngeal, radionecrosis, non-healing wounds, and radiated tissue beds. So where is this field going? Uh, one uh, entity which I included here was uh, for myocardial infarction. Uh, it's thought to, uh, well, basic science has shown that it can reverse uh, hypoxia in marginally perfused areas. It can modulate tissue repair. Uh, it can increase antioxidant, uh, sorry, antioxidant uh, enzyme expression in uh, tissues and plasma. It can also help mobilize stem cells and uh, aid with uh, revascularization of healing tissue. This is a force plot that's taken from uh, a Cochrane review published in 2015. Um, it's for the risk of death, 
as you can see, they were able to identify and include six very small randomized controlled trials. Um, overall, they did find some evidence of people with ACS uh, that are likely, that are less likely to die or have major adverse events, um, and also to have more rapid relief from pain if they received hyperbaric oxygen therapy as part of their treatment of everything else that is included in the treatment of an acute MI. But as you can see here, uh, the relative risk is 0.58 or uh, uh, is a reduction of risk of death by 42% in the HBOT group. But we had to take these conclusions with a fair amount of skepticism because they're based on relatively small randomized controlled trials. Uh, they, uh, they, the Cochrane uh, uh, authors gave it a very low confidence rating, largely due to the non-blighted nature of the, stu of the studies, uh, stating that there could be a bias uh, due to placebo uh, effect. Randomized controlled trials in hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a, a challenge. Uh, some of it is because uh, of the uh, numbers of patients that can come through uh, rapidly or not rapidly. Uh, the also, it's, it's also hard to identify a, a control group or a sham group. Uh, even putting someone into a chamber and not increasing the pressure and not increasing the oxygen got delivered still does seem to confer some placebo effect or something along those lines. There are other uh, designs like crossover designs where they start a group of patients with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and then the other group not with any therapy and then take the control group and, make, and give them hyperbaric oxygen therapy and see what the differences are. That seems to work a little bit better, but it's also not, so it's also met with a fair amount of skepticism um, when actually published. Other uh, directions uh, include uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, it's thought to improve neuroplasticity and also reduce uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. Randomized controlled trials are, uh, are still ongoing, but four small randomized controlled trials didn't find, uh, while they did find immediate improvement in multiple scales of uh, uh, cognition and other tests, it didn't seem to be sustained greater than six to 12 months. And then uh, finally, uh, aging, uh, it's kind of reversal of aging. Uh, a small trial got a lot of media coverage last year um, where they were able to show that they increased the length of telomeres in T cells and B cells by about 20% and decreased immunosenescence of the T cells uh, by 10 to 37%. Uh, they had taken 30 adults, about an average age of 68 years, and given them 60 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This is still in its ex extremely, extremely early phase, but it has been kind of shown in basic science that these things do occur as well. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is the administration of 100% oxygen under increased pressure conditions, which is safe and efficacious when appropriately utilized for the right indications. HBOT is proven to be beneficial for indications like necrotizing fasciitis, soft tissue radiation injury, failing flaps, and diabetic foot ulcers. I think the key thing here is to remember that HBOT is not a miracle worker. It, it, it's, in, it's, in, it's an important adjunct to all of the other stuff we normally do for wounds and other uh, conditions. Uh, like we have to do good wound care. We have to provide the appropriate antibiotics um, and also to optimize revascularization. But if all of those are met and we add on hyperbaric oxygen therapy, there is a, ch a chance that we can accelerate the healing of challenging wounds and hopefully improve quality of life. That's the end. Questions? Could you tell us a little bit about the process uh, so the physicians here can know uh, in terms of referral to get you know, somebody evaluated? Uh, 
how does it actually work and then what happens if they are accepted? You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, you just have to put in uh, a referral um, either through Epic is one way to do it. The other thing is that you can call the, uh, the room clinic and that would also be a way to get in touch with us. Or you can just call me and I'll run over and see the patient if they're inpatient. Uh, or make arrangements for you. Uh, I think uh, there are multiple applications that we can uh, consider for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. If you see wounds on feet, or sometimes those difficult to heal sternal wounds can also be a potential, um, if they, especially if they have osteomyelitis in them and they're not, they're just not healing. So. That was very good. Thank you for that. I didn't know any of this. Um, what? How sustainable is the? the treatment for uh, radiation in, induced uh, bone or soft tissue injury, does it persist over time or does it recur? So uh, for wounds from radiation uh, injury, once they're healed, they are healed, uh, essentially. Uh, could a new wound form in the same bed? For sure. Uh, there is uh, Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not permanently changing everything about that area. Uh, so the tissue is still fragile. It's still resistant to heal. And they sometimes need to come back for more hyperbaric for a different wound as opposed to the same wound. Similarly, you see this with uh, uh, patients with uh, wounds on their feet because they have poor arterial flow down there. I mean, we had to dive one guy in the last two years I think three times because he keeps getting new wounds on his heel um, and we just we heal it and then we send him out and he comes back anywhere from one month to about four months later and with a new wound and we had, and there's like nothing else that we can do other than amputate because it, there's not much uh, avenue for an endovascular or an open repair for him. The online question from Dr. Kapot who asks uh, when used for sternal wounds uh, does this cause any hemodynamic issues? Good question. Uh, so the it's hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a pretty safe treatment. It doesn't really change too much, uh, other than for at least from a hemodynamic standpoint, it does increase high blood you know blood pressures, um, and uh, you know in patients with heart failure, there you know you have to be a little bit more careful. So instead of running people at 2.4 or two two point or you know two and a half times the normal pressure, we run them at maybe two times the normal pressure and and for a shorter duration of time and therefore uh, reduce the chance of that having exacerbation of that heart failure. But I, I honestly don't know of any uh, physiologic uh, manifestation like uh, um, consequences of this specifically to sternal wounds. Did you, did you say that the blood sugar drops? Uh, what is the mechanism for that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that we know in uh, completely. Uh, I think it changes how, uh, um, how the uh, insulin resistance is occurring. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it basically potentiates the effect of insulin and things like that. So it just drops the blood sugar is what they think. I don't know that we know for sure. A lot of... Unfortunately, a lot of things in hyperbaric oxygen therapy have been proven in basic science and some in clinical, when there's a lot of effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy that we just don't know, unfortunately. So that, so that drop in blood sugar is even someone with, who's normal glycemic uh, at the time? Uh, well, we don't test them. It's only, only people who are diabetic that we would really test. And I think this all really is more in insulin-dependent diabetes, but that also has not been uh, completely elucidated. It's only during the session. Only during the session. So you know they they kind of you know that's why we tell them to maybe give half half their dose of insulin before they show up. So you know they can we usually dive them if they're at around 150, um, and so because they could drop anywhere as much as 50 point you know 50 uh, by the time they uh, or they come out. So. No other questions? Thank you. Great.